Hey, come here. Are you thinking about buying a house hack, but you still have questions about the process? Well, in this video, I'm going to answer 13 of the most frequently asked questions about the house hacking process. Everything from what's involved to saving money, to financing options, to the question of whether it even still makes sense in today's market. And the best part, all of my answers come from my personal experience. From buying my first rental property as a house hack, to learning how to be a landlord, to using it as a stepping stone to scale from a single duplex 12 years ago to 160 rental units today. You name it, I've done it. So if you're looking to learn more about the house hacking strategy, you've come to the right video. And let's get right into it. What is house hacking? Yeah, house hacking is a really simple strategy. You live in one of the units, you rent out the other units, or live in one part of the property, you rent out the other part of the property. And the whole point of house hacking is to offset the cost of living for yourself and also to start building equity in your real estate and your rental property. And then on top of it, to learn how to be a landlord and how to manage tenants, figure out maintenance issues and do all those types of things. It's essentially like using training wheels on a bike. When you're first learning how to ride a bike, the first thing you would do is you wouldn't jump on an Olympic style bicycle and start going down a mountain. You're obviously going to go with something a lot smaller, a lot more safe. So training wheels is how I like to refer to the house hacking strategy. Is house hacking something that makes sense to do in the current market? So you can always find a profitable or workable house hack, no matter what the market is. Obviously, in today's market, we're running into some pretty serious headwinds. You obviously have the really high interest rates on one hand. So 7%, 7.5% interest rates, even for owner-occupied loans, which what they would be for house hacking. So it obviously drives up the cost of purchasing a property like that. And on the other hand, you also have a very low supply in the market of rental properties that would be considered good house hacks. And when I talk about house hacking and house hacks that are going to be good and conducive to the strategy, I'm talking about anything from a single family house with multiple bedrooms to uh, a four unit apartment building. You can't really go any higher with a house hacking strategy because then you're losing the entire benefit of having the owner occupied financing, which has some very favorable terms. And, you know, anywhere in between that is a reasonable type of property. But those properties right now are in high demand. You do have a lot of potential buyers who are interested in those types of properties. And a lot of the sellers are kind of sitting on the sidelines and they're not selling those houses for various reasons. One of them being is if they are owner occupying those properties themselves, then that means that they have very low interest rates on their mortgage, most likely. And if they have to sell that property and move somewhere else, they're trading that low interest rate mortgage for a much higher interest rate mortgage. And so they're not really interested in, in, in selling those houses. With that said, you can always find deals. It doesn't matter. People say this all the time to me. You know, I, I talk to multiple investors every week that are you know just trying to get in and they're saying, oh, you know, it's so hard to find stuff. If you look hard enough, if you know how to look, if you first start working with a really good real estate agent who understands the market, who's been in the game for a while in your local area, wherever you're looking to find a house hack, you can find those deals. And the really good real estate agents, the ones that are really have the their finger on the pulse of the market, they will have pocket listings and deals that are not on the market. Those are the types of real estate agents you want to be working with. And then aside from having a real estate agent on your side to, to help you find those types of deals, you also can start doing some of those other off-market strategies where you can do direct-to-seller communication and outreach. People do letter campaigns, postcards, they cold call potential sellers of properties that they want to buy. So there are ways to find deals. It's a lot harder right now, I'm not going to lie, but you can still do it. Can I house hack if I'm working, have a family, and barely making ends meet? Yeah, if you're in a position where you're struggling and financially and you're month to month, paycheck to paycheck, I wouldn't necessarily say that you're ready to do a house hack. I, I don't think that something like that is a, a safe situation for you to jump into a much larger financial burden and obligation. So the first thing you got to do if you are living paycheck to paycheck, you have kids and you're renting currently, you got to get your financial life in order first. 
I mean, that's just the first thing that you have to do. You have to make sure you have some disposable income every month. You're making sure you're setting aside money for future investments. And if you can't do that, you got to pay off your debt. So there are some, some things going on with your financial situation, financial picture right now that is preventing you from having that type of disposable income. It may be you, you may have to cut down on your expenses, cut down on what the spending is. If you have high credit card bills and high credit card debt, you got to pay that off first. And on the flip side, if that's not the case, but you're still are short on funds and you just have enough to cover your living expenses and your general lifestyle, you're not being extravagant about it, then it's a, it's a matter of getting more income. You need to find a better job, get a second job, make sure your significant other is contributing, those types of things. And then in addition to that, I think a lot of people don't really realize this or understand this if they're thinking about, oh, I'm going to buy a house in a year or two, right? What are the things that they need to do besides having enough money for, say, a down payment and closing costs, things like that? Well, the other things are you got to check your credit score. You got to see what you're, where you're even at. You know, you got to know that you can qualify for a loan because having enough of a down payment is just one criteria that a lender will look at. So let's say you're going to do an FHA loan at three and a half percent down. That's your down payment. Okay, great. And you saved $15,000 you have in your bank account to invest, but you never checked your credit score. And then you go to apply for that loan and uh, your lender says, well, sorry, Mr. Smith, your credit score is like 460 points. You're not going to get a loan like that. So you need to know where you are at with that as well. The third thing you need to know is you need to know where you stand with your debt to income ratio. And debt to income ratio is something that is another metric that lenders look at where it, they look at all of your fixed expenses. So this would be like your car payment, your student loans, other expenses that you have that are recurring monthly expenses. And then they compare it to what your income is. And they take your gross income and they compare. It's a ratio, basically. And if your ratio is above the allowed maximums from those lenders, then they're also going to disqualify you. You won't be able to qualify for a loan. And there are different, depending on the loan product, there are going to be different ratios for this. But at the at best, you're not going to be able to get a loan if your debt to income ratio is over like 45, 50%. So if your expenses equal or exceed, say, 45% of your gross income on a monthly or annual basis, however, they, however you want to factor it, you're not going to be able to qualify. So in order to prepare yourself to buy a property, whether it's a single family house and primary re residence or a house act or anything else, you have to make sure that you have those three, at least three main criteria in line, which is you, get, you need to have enough money saved for down payment, closing costs and reserves, if any. You need to have a decent enough credit score. And for that, you really have to be at 580 points or higher. And this is 580 is really the bare bones minimum for an FHA loan to get those good favorable terms and preferably higher. And then the other thing you need to have is a lower debt to income ratio than I'll say 40%, 45%. You really want to be somewhere around a third and not more than that. When you consider all of your expenses combined, including the future housing expense. So that's what I would say. And that's, that's what people need to consider when they're thinking about getting into house hacking and qualifying for a loan. Hey guys, if you're getting value from this video so far, please do me a favor and hit the like button. And if you're just starting out with house hacking, grab my free house hacking checklist where I go over the seven most important things you need to do before you buy your first house hack. This checklist covers not only what to do, but also offers some actionable steps you can take right now to get started. The advice in this ebook comes from my own experience with house hacking and from years of building my rental portfolio from a single duplex to over 160 units today. If you're interested in getting a free copy, check out the link in the description below. If you have no credit score and no money in the bank, how would you get started in 2023 or 2024? The first thing you got to do in a situation like that, you, you have to invest in yourself. So people, you, you're not going to be able to make money. You're not going to be able to improve your credit. You're not going to be able to advance financially unless you have something valuable to offer someone else. And what I mean by that is, first and foremost, you, you need to be able to offer something valuable as an employee. That's going to be your first way, the initial way to make any kind of money. So if you're starting from zero, if you got no credit, you got no money in the bank, the first thing you got to do is you got to be a valuable enough employee to someone 
for them to hire you and for you to start making money so that you can start improving those those other criteria those other metrics so you need to invest in yourself that if that means picking up new skills doing some sort of apprenticeship if you have the ability to obtain some sort of degree or you know, you know vocational degree of some sort you go to school for it i don't know if you're going to be able to get student loans but there are loans and grant programs for all different income levels and you know starting points so you should be able to get some level of competency if you don't already have it in order to start working for someone else and start making money and once you get that job and you start working there then you've got to look for opportunities to increase your income and advance as you as you go up in the ranks you know whether it's at the same company with the same employer or you start out it's a stepping stone you start at mcdonald's right you're flipping burgers for a couple of years you you're making that minimum wage or whatever they're paying these days right in the meantime you're doing something else you know you're taking online classes you're going on on youtube you're learning new skills you got to level up every single time and so then you don't want to stay stagnant and stay c content with whatever job you end up starting out with you got to try to advance and try to improve and so from there as you as you go up the ladder and you start making a little bit more money each time with each new job and each new side hustle that you pick up you want to start saving that money you want to start sa setting some money aside and the key thing is too is as your income is increasing you don't want to continue or you don't want to start inflating your lifestyle at the same time so you want to make sure that things are in balance so if and as you are increasing your income, you want to try to keep your lifestyle cost as close to what it was when you started out as possible. Now, I understand, obviously, family and you find a significant other, you want to move in together, or you want to do certain things and you want to take nicer vacations and you want to spend a little bit. That's all understandable. I'm not saying that you live like a hermit and you don't do anything. All you do is suck away your money. All I'm saying is that you need to keep it in proportion. If your goal is to at some point obtain financial independence, at some point start investing in real estate or start you know, investing in the stock market or anything else, you got, you got to have a, a proper baseline and foundation in order to do that. And, and the way you obtain that foundation is by not overinflating your expenses and by at the same time increasing your income and putting away those savings and, and starting your investment. How much money do I need to save for a house hack? my advice to would-be house hackers who are asking the question of how much money do i need to save in order to have enough to buy my first house hack is to save at least 10 percent of whatever the price point you're going after so you right now we can anyone who's starting out can qualify for a three and a half percent down payment fha loan now there are different qualification criteria you obviously have to meet them debt to income credit score all those things but assuming you meet those right what's the what's the minimum amount of money that you need to come to the table with in order to close i would say you want to have at least 10 percent saved that could be ten thousand dollars if it's a really cheap hundred thousand dollar house or it could be sixty seventy eighty thousand dollars if it's a much more expensive house in a much more expensive area so all of that is relative and it's relative to the price so three and a half percent of that down payment or that that amount would go toward the down payment right then you're also going to have quite a few closing costs and there are a lot of different closing costs that come up between title insurance points that a, a lender might charge prepaid fees of different kinds escrow of taxes insurance all those things add up to significant amount of money up front and that is something that you either have to come up with on your own you have that money in the bank account so you would be taking that from that 10 percent that i'm talking about saving or there's a strategy where you could ask a seller to give you a seller concession or a credit toward those costs so essentially you'd be rolling that cost into the purchase price of the property and also it gets an, it ends up getting rolled into the loan itself so you you have to have some source of funds in order to cover those expenses but for me i would say the safest at least the baseline minimum amount will be 10% of whatever the purchase price is going to be. And if you can save more, all the better. I prefer to have some reserves as well as covering those hard costs in the beginning uh, in, when you're first buying the property and you're closing on it. You want to also have some funds set aside that can cover things that maybe unexpectedly break immediately after you buy the property. So if you spend all your, of your money that you saved on the down payment and the closing costs, and then you had $500 in your bank account and you 
are so happy that you got a property. Here you go. You just walk into it and now it's January and your furnace breaks and it's going to cost $3,000 to fix that furnace. And you only have $500 in your bank. That's a, that's a bad situation because now you have to go into some sort of debt, put it on a credit card, figure out another way to finance it because you don't have that money. So to me, I would say you want to have at least a few more thousand dollars in addition to the closing costs and the down payment set aside in order to cover those types of expenses and those types of unexpected occurrences. How long does it take to get a tenant for my house hack after I buy it? So the amount of time between purchasing a house hack and finding a suitable tenant will vary you know, significantly from case to case. I mean, I've when, when I purchased my first house hack, I there were two tenants, it was a duplex. There were two tenants occupying both units, right? So I intended to move into one of the units and I intended to rent out the other unit to a tenant. So what I said to a seller at the time when we were negotiating our deal and I said, look, I, I saw the tenants, I went in there, you know, when I did the walkthrough of the house and I really didn't like what I saw. First of all, they were not very clean. They had a ton of cats and I come to find out later that the cats had fleas on them. Then they were also paying below market rents. So all those factors to me basically were like, okay, I don't want these tenants when I buy the property. So I asked the seller and then we worked that into the deal that the tenants will be gone before we close. So they were month to month tenants. So I had the seller give them notices, appropriate notices in my state. The tenants vacated the property before I took ownership and then I closed on it. So what I did in my case at that point is I did some light remodeling to both units. So one to make my apartment livable to the condition that I would be happy living in. And I also did some work to the other apartment in order to get the market rents that I knew that the apartment could get. And this was a very light remodel at the time when I did my first house hack, I didn't know much about construction. I didn't know much about repairs, maintenance or any of that stuff. So I had to learn everything on the fly and I also paid contractors to do most of the work for me. I did the painting. I did a few other you know, plumbing things, a couple of minor things that I learned along the way. But for example, I changed carpets in all of the rooms. So the carpets were really old. They were like 10 years old, really ugly, dirty. They had, like I said, they had cats, animals, all that stuff. So all that had to go, carpets, pads, had that replaced. And then we did some other small little improvements, made the apartment look nice and fresh and clean. It wasn't necessarily the most up to date. I didn't have stainless steel appliances. I didn't splurge on that at the time, but it was good enough to get me to find my own tenant that would pay market rent and would be a good tenant in that building where they're going to be my neighbor. So to answer the question, how long does it take? Well, if you already have a perfect situation, you have a great tenant next door and there's nothing that needs to be done and they want to stay and they're paying market rent, it could be immediate. So you're buying a house hack, you're moving into one vacant unit and the house comes with a tenant that is already perfect for you. That's awesome. If you can find that situation, that's great. A lot of times you won't have that situation. There'll be some things that you will need to do after you close on that property. Like I said, in my situation, my case, it was a complete overhaul where the tenants left. I asked them to leave before the closing and then I turned it around and I did painting and I did remodeling. It could be something less drastic than that. you know. So that for me, that took a month or two before I got a new tenant in there. In a different situation, it might be just, we need to increase the rent. And the tenant says, oh, you know, I don't wanna pay that much. Okay, that's fine. So then they leave and then maybe you do a smaller remodel on the apartment and you re-rent re it. But in my experience, it's always better to screen and rent to your applicants, people that you pick for your apartment, as opposed to dealing with the original existing entrenched tenants because a lot of times they'll actually feel like they own the property more so than you and you're the interloper. You're coming in from the outside and you're kind of telling them, oh, this is going to be like this. And they're telling you, no, 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 we've been doing it like this and this is how we want this the things done. So there's a little bit of a power struggle in that situation and that happens all the time. And so legally, you're the owner, you're in charge. So you have to just act like it and take take charge of it. And if a tenant is going to be difficult, you, you want to move them on and then put your own tenants in there that will respect your rules that will be coming into it, knowing that you're there, you own the property and they're new to the property as opposed to the other way around. Can I house hack and pay a property manager to manage my tenants for me? There are two things. So one, 
You can definitely outsource property management to a property management company when you're doing a house hack or for any rental property for that matter. But I would say it makes a lot more sense to do that with a non-owner occupied situation versus an owner occupied situation. And that is, this is all personal preference. I think that th there's no right or wrong way to do this. I think that you could outsource it, but my personal feeling on it is you're kind of cheating yourself if you're doing that. Part of the benefit of doing a house hack is to learn how to be a landlord and how to manage tenants, manage difficult situations, figure out how this real estate strategy and game works. And if you're totally hands off and you're completely handing it off to someone else, then I think you're missing that part of it. And the other part of it too is, I'll be honest, most property managers are not going to do a very good job or as good of a job as you would because they don't care about that property as much as you do. So you might end up hiring someone and then you might end up being frustrated because the level of effort that they're putting into things are not the same that you would put into them. And this feeling might be even more amplified because you're actually living at this property and you're seeing things firsthand that annoy you, but because you can't walk over next door and tell your tenant, hey, knock it off. You're playing music at 1130 at night or you're having a party over here. You're instead running to your property manager. And you're texting them and asking them to call to make that phone call. And maybe that property manager is not getting back to you until the next morning. So that is a recipe for frustration. And just you're simply handing off responsibility for something that you should be responsible for to someone else and then expecting the results to be the same as if you were doing it. And I just don't think that it works like that. Would you recommend house hacking as the first strategy for someone just getting started? There are many ways to get started in real estate. There are a lot of strategies, tactics. There are a lot of gurus that will push and tell you that you should follow their strategy. You got Airbnb, you've got just regular rental properties. You got the Burr strategy, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. You've got rental arbitrage. It's like you've got all these different strategies, wholesaling that different people push and they say, oh, it's the best way to start. It's, this is the best way to start. And this is the best way to start. But what a lot of these strategies entail and involve is a baseline knowledge of real estate investing, a baseline knowledge of being you know, financially savvy, of being a business person, all those things, whether it's knowing construction, there's just so many different aspects to a lot of these different strategies that you need to already be coming into them with in order to do them successfully at the level that these other people are telling you to be successful at. Whereas with house hacking, it's like I say all the time, it's just training wheels for your real estate investing success story. If you are interested in learning and you want to do it with the least amount of risk and the most amount of safety, house hacking is the best way to do it, especially if your living situation allows it. So if you are already living in a very expensive house, you are established, you have high paying job, your kids are in this good school district and your wife loves your current house, then maybe house hacking is not going to work for you because it would involve you selling that house or moving out of that house and renting that house to someone and then moving into a different house where you're sharing space with tenants. If that's you, that then house hacking isn't the way to start. You know, then maybe you want to do a turnkey investing somewhere in Midwest where you pay another company, you just dump $200,000 because you have that in your bank account, dump it into a property and let them run it for you completely hands off. And you perform your surgeries as a doctor at the local hospital and you're just reaping the 7% profits that you make off that. That's totally fine. If that's your situation, then that's the way you want to do it. But most people, the people that I talk to are in a situation where they're currently renting and they're looking to improve their financial situation. Or maybe they live in a small house or maybe they're just graduating college and they're still living with their parents, but they're thinking about what am I going to do once I start that new job? Do I rent? Do I live at home? Do I buy a single family house or do I buy a, a multifamily house and move into it as a house hack? And for me, the answer for to all of those people in, in that situation is absolutely house hack. Do it once. Like you don't you don't have to do it forever. You don't have to live in that situation forever. Like I lived in a house hack for four years and then I moved on and I bought a single family house after that. And I continued investing in real estate and I have 160 units currently as we speak. So you can pivot, you can go to those other different strategies, but the, the foundation is laid there when you use the house hacking strategy because it allows you to learn the things you don't know 
at your own pace with little risk and while offsetting your living expenses. So for me, the house hacking strategy is the best strategy for starting out for the majority of people. Should I rent, buy a single family house or house hack? When people ask whether they should buy a house or rent or which strategy is better, I would say it's, I either, either say it's neither or I would say it's a hybrid of the two and that would be house hacking. So yes, it's true in most areas, it's cheaper to rent than it is to own a home. But we're talking about when people say that people are talking about a primary residence because you have to factor in taxes, insurance, ex other expenses, maintenance, repairs, all those things that you don't have to worry about as a renter. But the flip side of it is that, of course, the people that own their own property, the house that they live in, they also do get a benefit of some tax benefits. They also have the appreciation and the loan pay down that occurs. So those factors are not present when you're renting. But I know people have done some complex analysis and they've looked at this and it depends on what city you're in, but they still say, well, the opportunity cost is is lower with renting because you can still save money while you're renting because you're not having to pay money for all those other different expenses that I just mentioned. And then you put that money in the stock market and or somewhere else, some another type of investment, and you're going to make passive, you know, 10% or 8% year over year on that money. And you end up farther ahead than those people that are just owning their primary residence as opposed to renting. But to me, there's a third option that nobody talks about. And the third option is buying a rental property, a small multifamily rental property, which can also be your house. And that is house hacking. You're living in one of the units, you're renting out the other unit. So you've got the benefit of the appreciation, the loan pay down, the tax advantages, and you're living in the property typically for a reduced cost or almost free if depending on how many units you have and how much rent you've got coming in. And you're taking advantage of both of those things. So you may be living in a house hack for the same cost overall when you count all the expenses and you, you factor in your tenants rent income that they're paying you at the same cost as if you were just renting somewhere else, right? If you were renting an apartment, you may have the same exact expense or the same exact expense structure. And so that still allows you to save money and do what other gurus are telling you when they're telling you you should just rent and invest in the stock market. And you can still do that with a house hack. So you're taking advantage of both of those. And if you do any kind of metrics and you, you do some analysis on this, you're always coming out ahead with the house hacking strategy ahead of both of those scenarios. You're coming out ahead of the renters and you're coming out ahead of, of just the single family primary residence occupiers who are not utilizing any part of their property as a house hack to rent out to tenants. Let's say you could rent a three bedroom apartment or a house. Let's say you could rent a three bedroom house in your area, wherever you live for $1,500 a month plus your utility costs. So like, let's say $1,500 is your monthly rent payment to the landlord. And then you spend another $300 on your gas and electric. Okay. Every single month. So your all in cost is $1,800. You don't have to worry about paying any taxes. You're not fixing anything in the property. You don't have to fix that boiler when it, when it goes, like you don't have to fix the roof or replace it. None of that stuff is your responsibility. If something breaks, you call your, call up your landlord and it's your landlord's responsibility to pay for it and to fix it and, and to incur that expense, right? So you're all in expenses, $1,800. Now let's say that that same house, if you were to buy it right now is going to cost you $2,500 per month with just taxes, insurance, principal and interest on your mortgage, right? $2,500 for those things. Well, that's still not accounting for the other expenses that you have that go along with that house. Same thing that a landlord would be responsible for. You are responsible for if that's your primary residence. So your repairs and maintenance. So if things break, that's on you. You have to spend that money. It's an actual cost. You can spread it out and calculate it over time and you can figure out exactly what a, on a monthly basis that would come to. You have to replace the roof. Now the roof is going to cost you $20,000. Maybe that expense won't occur for another five or 10 years, but it's going to occur. And so in order to account for that expense, you have to factor it on a monthly basis into your total housing cost of, of owning that house, right? So it's not just comparing $1,800 to $2,500. It's comparing 
what it'll be for those additional expenses. Now, you're living in that house, so $2,500 also does not include your utility costs. Just like you have utility costs when you're renting, you're gonna have utility costs to the power companies when you own the house, right? So that's another $300 on top of that. So now you're talking about $2,500 was your principal and interest taxes and insurance, another $300 for utilities, so now you're at 2,800. And let's say that all the other maintenance and repairs costs come to another $300, $400 per month. So now you're talking about being somewhere around $3,200 per month as your out-of-pocket expense to own this property versus $1,800 per month to live in that property, but to rent it, right? So the difference between those two, $1,400 per month, is something that in theory, the renter is saving. And that renter can then take that $1,400 that they would have spent if they owned that house and put that money in the stock market. And that money could earn them seven, 10, 8%, whatever it is over time and grow and create wealth for them, right? The owner at the same time, no, they're not losing that entire $3,200, right? Some portion of that, probably three, four, five hundred dollars a month is going toward paying off the mortgage on that house. So they are building equity in that sense, but it's obviously not at a $1,400 pace per month. It's somewhere around five to $600, especially in the beginning. And so that's why when people are comparing those two, they're saying, well, Yes, the owner is going to have the benefit of loan pay down and they could expect maybe a 3% growth on equity in their property in addition to the equity pay down that they're realizing when they're paying off their mortgage. But still, when they're comparing the two between the owner and the renter who's investing in the stock market, they're investing that $1,400, they're saying that that renter would come ahead of the owner after a 25 or 30 year period. What I'm saying is that you want to be both. You want to get the benefit of both. If you could live in that single family house, you own that house for your total entire expense would be $1,800. And you still then therefore have the $1,400 to invest in the stock market. You'd be able to do that. And the way you live in that house for $1,800 is you rent out some part of that house to a tenant who's paying off a large chunk of the rest of those expenses that I mentioned in our example. So maybe it's a granny apartment, maybe it's an in-law suite, maybe you've, you've converted the garage that's detached, now you have a rental income coming in, that's a way to house hack that house. And that's a way to get the best of both worlds, and that's a way to circumvent this entire argument. So the answer to the question is, should I buy or should I rent, is not rent or buy, it's buy a house hack. Is it possible to live for free with house hacking at today's prices and costs? I think it's possible to live for free in a house hack. I think it's very situation dependent, it's very property dependent, and then it's very location dependent. So there are so many different factors that go into play as to whether or not the property will be a, a live for free type of a property for you. It depends on how much rent you can get from the re rental portion of the property. So if you buy a four unit house and you live in one of those apartments and you rent out the rest of them, chances are you probably will be able to live for free because the three apartments that are occupied and rented to tenants will be able to cover all of your expenses on that property. You probably will have the zero expenses or close to it and maybe even possibly even exceed it, maybe even make some cash flow uh, month over month. Alternatively, maybe you're living in a very touristy area, very highly desirable area for people coming in for various attractions in your area. Well, in that situation, maybe you can make up that income even on a smaller property and it's not a four unit. Maybe it's just, like I said, maybe it's a single family house with an in-law apartment and you rent out that in-law apartment on short-term rental basis. So you're renting it out on Airbnb and you're making thousands of dollars a month enough to cover your whole cost of that property for you. So there's another way that you could possibly live for free. But it depends, right? So it, it's not obvious if we're just talking in the abstract that just because you buy a house hack, you're going to be able to live for free or not going to be able to live for free. The devil is always in the details and it just matters as to how you position the property, how you rent it out and what features and amenities it has and what are the components of the property. So to answer the question succinctly, yes, you can, but not every time and not everywhere. What if I do everything right and interest rates go higher before I close? Yeah, interest rates play a huge part, of course, of any financing situation, whether it's a house hack or non-owner occupied rental property. 
interest rates will tend to increase your expenses. And that's just a fact right now. So interest rates right now, as of the date of this recording, are somewhere around seven, seven and a half percent. So yeah, if you look back two years ago when the interest rates were three and a half percent or four percent, it's going to be a major difference depending on the purchase price of the house as to how much your expenses are on that house. So if you're saying, if I'm doing everything right, I prepare myself and I go to apply for a loan and now the interest rates are much higher than they were, well, that can happen. And But that's where you, you take that into account. Typically, an interest rate is not going to jump, at least from where we stand right now, at seven or seven and a half percent. It's not going to jump another four or five percent in the month or month and a half from the time you get a property under contract. So that's not really what we're talking about. So we're talking about you decide that you're going to house hack, say on January 1st, 2024, right? And you need a year to save up money, to improve your credit, to do all the things that you need to do to get in a position where you can buy a house, right? And then by December 31st of 2024, interest rates shot up 2% or 3%. That just happened to people. That happened you know, a year ago, right? Well, then you just look for a better deal or you look for a better situation or you end up paying a little bit more. But depending on the prices, I mean, that that percentage increase might mean $300 more per month or might mean $500 more per month or $700 more per month. It all depends on what your purchase price is. And then what? how much rent are you, are you receiving to offset that expense or those expenses? A lot of the rents across the country, as the interest rates were rising, the rents were rising too because the demand for rentals increased as fewer and fewer people were able to afford primary residence houses, single family houses. So they didn't, they decided not to buy, they didn't buy and they decided, oh, I'm going to rent for another year or I'm going to rent for two years. That increased the pool of renters, which in turn pushed up the prices of rents. So just as your mortgage costs may have gone up because of higher interest rates, the rents that you could get from tenants in that house hack have also gone up. So it may be a wash, it may be close. You may you may not see that big of an impact. You got to evaluate the entire deal and see what makes sense and what doesn't make sense with the numbers with that specific property. Should I get a variable interest rate mortgage or a fixed rate mortgage for my house hack? Well, it's an interesting question. Should you get a variable interest rate loan right now or should you lock it in at seven or seven and a half percent? Nobody has a crystal ball, I will say that. The Fed recently announced that they're going to be cutting rates over the next year or so. So there's a lot of speculation that interest rates are going to drop in the next year. They don't know by how much. I've seen all kinds of predictions. I've seen some crazy predictions that say they're going to go down as low as 4%, which I think is very unlikely. Some have said, some analysts and talking heads on TV, they say, well, maybe it'll go to 6%, 6.5%, 5.5%. You just don't know. And to me, I think I look at the fundamentals of a property. And if the fundamentals of the purchase that you're making, meaning that its components, where it is, the location, the type of renters you can get, the good school district that it is, that it's going to appreciate in value, all those different things, I think that's what matters more than the few percentage points of interest rates. So to me, me personally, I would rather lock in a rate right now at whatever it is and buy a property that makes sense with the numbers as opposed to try to float a rate and hope and pray that it's going to go down. And then if it doesn't, then you're stuck with something else, or maybe something higher. Like, I just don't, I don't need that uncertainty. There's enough uncertainty in owning real estate and investing in real estate that you don't need to necessarily inject this type of uncertainty into the deal. And worst case scenario, if the rates do drop, which I'm sure they will in the next few years, at some point they're going to go down. If they go down enough for it to make sense for you to go back to a bank and refinance, then you would just refinance it at that time. Now, there are going to be some closing costs and some other expenses associated with that refinance at that time, maybe say three years from now. But at that point, presumably you would have paid down or your tenants would have paid down some of the mortgage already. You can have more equity in the property. Hopefully the property had appreciated in value over time as well. So there are offsets to that cost at that time. And then you can refinance and lock yourself into another 25 years or 28, seven years or however long you want to do it for a much lower interest rate than it is now. But I wouldn't sit on the sidelines and I also wouldn't necessarily use a floating variable interest rate as a way to try to catch the rates on the way down next time around. If I want to get into house hacking, 
What is the best type of loan I should use? Is FHA the best option? Yes, so there are several different loan options and they depend on you as a borrower in, in some part. So there are VA loans, which offer a 0% down payment or allow a 0% down payment, which are available to veterans. So folks that were in the military service in the United States at one point or another, that's an awesome option for anyone who qualifies for that type of a loan. Obviously you have to have been in the military, right? So if you're not in that category, then that wouldn't apply to you. You wouldn't be able to get that. There are also USDA loans, which are loans for properties that are located in, in rural areas. So if you're looking in a rural area, and there are many areas that you might not consider or think that are located in the rural area, and you might want to check because you might think, oh, you know, it's just out somewhere in the suburbs, this and that, but it might actually be in a rural area where you can qualify for a USDA loan. Now, there are different restrictions with that. Last I looked, I believe USDA loans were allowed only for single family houses. So you can't do the multifamily house hack strategy that I like but personally, but you could possibly do a single family house hack strategy. But you got to look at all the factors because even if you did get it and you could rent it out, are there people who want to live that far away from a you know metro area that you want to you know have as tenants? So there are different factors with that. So that's another type of loan. A third type of loan is the one that you just mentioned, which is an FHA loan. And that is typically the go-to for most people who are just starting out, typically new to real estate, new to real estate investing and, and buying properties and owning them. And that is because FHA loans are federally insured loans and they have the lowest barriers to entry. So the minimum credit scores are much lower than conventional loans, which I'll talk about in a second. The down payment requirement is as low as you can possibly find other than those other options that I just mentioned. If you don't qualify for those other options, three and a half percent is something that's available with an FHA loan, which is not available with conventional loans. So that's attractive because you don't have to have as much money saved. You also have more lenient debt to income requirements where you could have more debt monthly and still qualify for that loan relative to your income versus a conventional loan. So all those factors, I think, play a role. And depending on the size of the unit or size of the property you're going for, whether you're going for a single family, a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, there are some other variations and some other considerations with an FHA loan. For example, an FHA loan on a three and a four unit property will have a self-sufficiency test, which basically says that if you take yourself out of the equation and you assume that you are renting the apartment you're gonna occupy, right? and you, you figure out what the rental income for that would be on the, on market, and you add up all the other units that are occupied that are collecting rent, and you take 75% of that, does that cover your costs and expenses on the property? And housing expenses, which are typically principal interest, taxes, insurance. If they don't, if, if your total rents are less than those expenses, then you're not gonna be able to qualify. That's one of the rules of FHA on a three and a four unit property. If, and if they do, if, if you have a positive cash flow, if that number is larger than those expenses combined, then you will pass that test. And that's one of those criteria that is met. And you can qualify assuming all the other criteria are met. You don't have that right now. That's not required, at least by Fannie Mae, which is a federal agency that insures owner occupied loans like this with conventional financing. So conventional financing is the other type of loan that's available. Okay, it is something that's offered by most lenders, most banks, credit unions, they offer this type of loan. Now they allow you to buy a multifamily property that you're going to live in for just 5% down. So with a conventional loan, you don't have to meet the self-sufficiency test and you can actually buy a three or four unit property where you don't even have to prove to them that if you moved out of that property, the income would cover the expenses. You can just buy it and they won't, they won't even ask you that, but you will have to put 5% down instead of three and a half percent down. So there's a trade-off with that. So the bottom line is that there are multiple different options that are available to people, depending on their situation, depending on the type of property they're looking at for financing a house hack. And so my best advice to folks would be to, you can do research online, you can watch YouTube videos, you can watch and follow other content creators and get the information, but the best place, the best source would be to talk to a mortgage broker or a loan officer at your local bank and find out what are the criteria, what's required for each different type of loan and what options are available to you. 
If the house hacking strategy has piqued your interest, you may be wondering just how much an average house hack can add to your net worth over time. If you are, then this next video should give you a pretty good idea. Tap or click the screen to watch it, and I will see you there.